I come from a very tumultuous background. Uh, so my mom's favorite hobby was getting married and divorced. There was a lot of that. And that's, you know, she would hate me for saying it, but it's also one of those, like, you need some hard truths in your life. You need the tough love. A lot of uh, different drug use and just different issues there. I'm probably the, I'm trying to think if there's anybody else. I'm the only one of my immediate family that has not been incarcerated and especially incarcerated recently. To give you an idea of kind of the, where I came from, you know, and it was uh, not to say I wasn't in that life when I was younger, but it was more so I kind of hit a turning road or, or a crossroads and a turning point where I was like, I'm either going to perpetuate my family tree or I'm going to, you know, make some decisions to change this, right? Do I want to keep living this life? Well, and you see, you see things. So growing up like that, you know, I had friends literally die in front of me, you know, it's uh, just from the product of their lifestyles and things like that. Uh, and it kind of hits you at some point, you know, some people, they either dig in and they dig their heels and well, I'm going to survive in this. And then other people say, you know, I need to find something different. There's got to be a different route. And that was, uh, kind of the route I chose, you know, um, I am half Afro Latino and half Iranian. My mother, uh, and her family moved here during the Iranian revolution. So in the late sixties, early seventies, uh, and so during the revolution, when they were overthrown, they sought asylum here along with the Shah's wife and his family. And then my mother came here when she was 16, lived the sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle. She was the black sheep of the family, you know, coming from a very conservative space over there into the U.S. at a very pivotal point in her life. Uh, my biological father, also very much so in the sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle. So there's kind of the very macro level of a very, uh, I guess, atypical childhood. Coming together, my mom's family was Muslim, more culturally than practicing religious, but they were Muslim, and um, my biological father's family being Afro-Latino's descent, they were Catholic, um, and so I kind of grew up back and forth between these ideologies. Um, my mom's third husband was very Catholic, and his family was very Catholic, so uh, I met him when I was six. And uh, then we attended Catholic Church. I was, you know, baptized as a child in the Catholic Church, confirmed in the Catholic Church. I was a Knight of Columbus, all the, you know, I was all in, all in, because that's what I thought I was supposed to do. Eventually, just Amber and I, uh, that's my ex-wife, were looking just for a place to kind of raise the kids that was very progressive and like forward thinking, like uh, really trying to embrace the idea of people who are rejoicing in their faith as opposed to mourning it, right? Like as opposed to looking at your faith as a way to limit the things you're doing in your life, but really rejoicing in the freedom that you had in it. And so we kind of settled in the Methodist church. It's, you know, quite the, uh, quite the religious journey, I suppose, you know, kind of runs the gamut. So for me, it's been interesting, you know, in Christianity because I came to it from primarily an Islamic background. So, you know, learning it and really not really making faith my own until I was an adult because I was kind of culturally a Christian in the Catholic Church, and I went through as very, uh, you know, I did the things that I was supposed to do. I dotted the I's, I checked the boxes, because that's what people did. But it wasn't, my faith probably wasn't my own until I was probably 24, 25. So having a background in other other faith and then coming to that, it, it's, it was uh, wild to me, and it kind of, it was both a blessing and a curse, right? Like I can walk into these churches where people grew up knowing the songs and doing the things, and I knew none of it because I just didn't have that exposure. But in the same regard, I also didn't have a lot of the bad practices or like uh, the dogma that had come with everybody else that had grown up, you know, like they, well, we always do it this way. We always not, and I'm the guy that's gonna question, well, if you always did it that way, why? Well, we just, we just have, and I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. And so we've gotten into a place, especially as Christians, where we sit in comfort and what's familiar we're really good at ministering to Christians, people already churched, and we're not good at getting outside that comfort zone, making ourselves vulnerable and loving people, and just realizing that loving somebody and bringing them into the Christian faith doesn't mean making sure they're sitting next to you every Sunday. It means sitting with them in the, like, the rough parts of their life because they may not have ever had that experience in their life. You know, It's a conversation I actually had uh, with another pastor, like, who's also into CrossFit, I'm into CrossFit or just in the gym culture. And we were talking about how crazy is it that I can walk into another gym 
and feel more welcome in a CrossFit gym because we work out similarly than I do walking into a church on Sunday. Like, what marks are we missing, you know, as a Christian? Like, we've created all these rules and things, and loving people, like, doesn't have to be just somebody who's in a, a suit on Sundays. Like, you know, it, loving somebody is just living your life side by side and just treating people well, and, you know, it doesn't have to be these specific check boxes that we've created to automatically, you know, mark us as good Christians. The entire point, we should be turning our hearts and minds towards them, living like that, living better, loving people, bringing everybody along for the ride. So it's very much so, and I mean, that's kind of a founding principle for my entire life, like that greater good mentality. If it's for the greater good and I'm bringing people and I'm loving people and leading by example, then we're creating like this healthy culture where we remember that people matter, right? It's not the things, the beliefs. We have such this divisive rhetoric that we follow now, especially in politics and life and culture. We're walk into a room and you're looking to divide out, oh, they're different than me, they're different than me, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to sit, as opposed to like trying to find our commonality, right? Like, and that's really that idea of like trying to find commonality for me is what's kind of driving my healing at where I am in life right now. You know, we have kind of talked to this, like where I started and kind of where, where I've gone in my, my faith journey. Um, I can either live with my eyes in the rearview mirror on what I did or what was wrong, or I can start reinventing or re-embracing who I am and who I want to be going forward, right? This is a new chance to kind of show the kids, I want life and love to look like this. Healthy love looks like this, you know? And, and making sure that I'm leading, you know, with this idea for me that right now, to bring it full circles, this greater good, like, if I can do something that is not necessarily what I'm comfortable with or, you know, what I want, but it's for a greater good. It's helping somebody else. It's loving well. It's doing what Jesus would do, right? Like uh, something my grandfather told me when I was a young man, and it's something that's kind of stuck with me. He says, are you living like you know Jesus? Are you living like you know about Jesus? And he said there's a very distinct difference there, you know, if you're living like you know Jesus, does your life look like it? Does it reflect it? Are you living like you know about Jesus? Are you throwing Bible darts? Are you talking about, I know this knowledge, I know this knowledge, I know that, but your day-to-day -day actions aren't changing? He's like, which type of person do you want to be? And so that's been something that's kind of stuck with me, you know, for my, my whole life. I'm like, and now I guess, you know, in these last few years as I'm kind of healing from this divorce and whatnot, I'm like, well, how have I been living, you know? And especially like with my kids, how am I loving my kids? Am I loving my kids like I know Jesus? Or am I loving my kids like I know about Jesus? The biggest thing for me as I've gone through this and realizing that it's a season has freed me to really embrace the fact that if I choose to get up every day and focus on the negatives, I'm going to find negatives every day. If I get up, like, that's not to say that there's not a place for it, right? There's stages of grief. You're going to go through the anger. You're going to go through the depression. And sometimes you got to sit in it. And it just sucks. There's no way to rush through it. But if I actively make the choice to look for the positives and embrace those, it's easier for me to find those in the day. I guess that bit of hope or that ray of hope is just to realize that it's a season, to realize that it's going to come and go. It's not a linear progression. But making sure that in those seasons and in those nonlinear progressions that we're acknowledging the little things and and just realize you're, there's growth and healing there and give yourself credit for it because you don't need to go out there and get the, all the credit from everybody else if you're able to realize it for yourself like all right I made some I made some good choices today I am you know I'm constantly getting better it doesn't have to be on somebody else's time frame you know it just got to be I've got to put my head down and get through it and just acknowledge like I'm here in this, but it's not where I'm gonna be forever.